My life started in 1989 on the side of a poorly paved road in Kentucky and began in 2011 on a manicured sidewalk in Manhattan. The year I got wise. The year I rose from the porch and started walking. The year I let my beard grow and let my hair get greasy. The year I said hello to a half dozen strangers who were kind enough to slow down for a blonde-haired kid claiming he was going to visit his relatives in Rochester. The year I met Lori, Freedom, and lost both. We met at Zuccotti Park at the Occupy Wall Street encampment. She was a freckle-faced girl from Nebraska with red hair and green eyes who enjoyed strumming a guitar she inherited from her uncle who had been killed in a motorcycle accident coming back from a run to Sturgis. I had somehow convinced this angel from a small town that I could play. Of course, it was an honest lie. All I knew were three chords, G, C, D, and my limited songs consisted mainly of Hank Williams and Merle Haggard. But Lori just smiled and let me think she was impressed. That was when I tripped. I saw those perfect white teeth from the plains and went head over heels in love. Our first night, we snuggled and kissed while megaphones blared out communal speeches designed to inform the growing mass of disgruntled humans. All was well until it got bone-chilling cold. All summer long, people had been allowed to gather at the park without much hassle, but when it got cold, so too did the hospitality. The raids started at night while we were curling toes. The cops would rush in like bully thugs sent a thunderburst of Union blockade. Once in the camp, they would shout, kick, and pull tents down forcing the occupants to run away in shrieking horror. This one time, Lori and I had planned ahead, and made our way to an alley where we could get warm under an exhaust vent. While resting against a wall and listening to the mask getting hurt, this girl came running down the street wearing nothing but her coat. As she vanished in the darkness of the alley, Lori stood up and took chase. Thinking she would return, I stayed where I was. But to sum it all up, she never did. Confused and trembling from panic, I strode the crowds for hours, begging for any information. Occupy Wall Street was no longer some magical place to rediscover the 1960s. It had transformed into a land of zombies stoned on apples and oranges, able to haphazardly explain Bolshevik prophecy but unable to aid in the finding of a girl who had somehow sprinted from the planet. With no way to connect, I simply started out of the city to make my way across a thousand miles with a sinking feeling that Lori was no longer simply missing. Back home, in the humid hills of Kentucky, I moped around the bars, drank heavy, and took up smoking dope like a true believer. My father, who had long been out of my life for no other reason than he was a hard-edged cop that drove my mother into the arms of another man, suddenly began to step in as a mentor trying to guide me back to the straight and narrow of capitalism. However, after Occupy Wall Street, my attitude was bent for leather. And one moonlit night, at the peak of summer, I hit the road, bound for Colorado, where I had friends in the reefer community. Once in town, I spent a good portion of my time around bonfires and back porch steps where my mind was tested on politics, philosophy, and psychedelic ventures. From this episode, I met a cool SoCal chick named Holly, who had blown into town on a cloud of smoke and a Southwest 737. Holly talked fast and knew the same. Our first night, we told curled several times, and by morning I was so limp I felt stress would never return. When she finally crawled her naked self out from the twist of the covers, I was re-kicked back in a reclining chair at the edge of the bed where I could puff a vanilla-flavored cigarello by admiring the morning sunrise and her pear-shaped breast and firm nipples. The sheet she was holding slipped down around her tender pale hips, and for a moment I felt I was seeing a living statue of Venus. I only wasted a year in Colorado before heading home. Part of the problem was that Holly had a warrant and needed to return to California or face serious jail time. The other problem... Well, she had a propensity to bed down with close friends, who, when discovered, accused me of spying. Fed up and frustrated a few days before Christmas 2012, I tucked my tail between my legs and caught a greyhound back home to Kentucky where my father was waiting for me with a stern lecture about my getting with the program. Apparently, my being gone had brought disgrace on the family, and he wanted to atone for the blemish of his prodigal son. 
My father insisted I get a job. He found me work washing police cars and doing general maintenance around the police station. It was a lousy job, but easy. Worse, I worked alongside friends, many of which were locked up in jail and assigned manual labor for good behavior. One day, while wiping down a hood, my father pushed open the door and started toward me. In his shadow were two men in black suits. Before they got to me, I knew they were high up on the pole, and everyone else around me knew the same. This ain't good, I heard someone whisper. Just like in the movies, they flashed their badges. But unlike the movies, before I could make a wise remark, they took me by the arm and led me back to the police station. What's this about? I asked, being shoved into a room and ordered to sit. Are you Joseph? You know this girl? They call me Joe, I replied. You seen this girl, Joseph? They placed a picture on the table. I looked down at it. My eyes grew wide. Yeah, that's Lori. She okay? She's dead, said the agent, who showed me the photo. They placed another picture down, along with another and another, until finally there were eight pictures laid out in front of me. The photos were from Zuccotti. They were pictures of me and Lori in the camp. I was confused and shocked and beside myself. How? I asked. That's why we're here, Joseph. I turned and looked up at my father. For a man who always wore a tan, he had gone pale. Oh, no, I blurted. You don't think I did it. You were with her in New York, said the agent. Yeah, but I was with a lot of people. She ran off after a naked chick. The agent raised a perplexed eyebrow, allowing the other a crack at me. The new one leaned down and bent his neck so he could glare at me from an angle. How old are you, Joseph? He asked. I peered up at my father. He had his face to the wall. Twenty-four, I replied. You know how old she was? Nineteen, because it was true. She said she was nineteen, I repeated. I remember her saying it. I'm sure she did, said the other agent, joining in. But she lied. She was seventeen. For crying out loud, shouted my father. I've heard enough. You got photos. You got your agenda. Are you guys going to read him his rights or ask a million questions about his sex life? I know how this game works. Relax. You relax, demanded my father. My son's on trial here. He's not under arrest, and everyone agrees, said the agent, looking down at me with sympathy, that she looks older. Your son made a mistake. I can't believe this, I said. I went to the police. In New York? Manhattan. What did they say? Wait in the lobby. Did you? No. But I had to find her. It was cold. The agents backed up and huddled. My father got down close to me and whispered for me to keep my mouth shut. But as he was giving me the second-hand legal advice, the agents interrupted. We're finished here. Worried, I turned to my father, who at my defense asked an agent, What do we do going forward? Do what you normally do, replied the agent, taking hold of the room's doorknob. Go home. Am I in trouble, I asked. Go home, replied the other agent. They exited the room without saying another word, not even an apology. But what kind of apology could I expect from two lawmen doing their sworn duty? Back at the house, my father went to the refrigerator and popped the tops off two cold ones. It was the first time in my life I ever shared a beer with my dad, and we both knew it would be the last. By morning, I was packed and hitchhiking a ride out of town with plans to go back to Colorado and take up working on an industrial pot farm. As I headed out of town with a heavy-set trucker hauling oranges, I kicked back in the cab and watched the morning sun stretch shadows to the west. The trucker asked me if I liked music, and smiling, he turned on real haggard. What the luck. The End You've been listening to Girl from Zuccotti, a short story written by Brooks Kohler in 2016. This story is fiction. Similarities to any person living or deceased are coincidence.